One in the front, very good. And I've left my ukulele at home, so I will rely on you to give me a note. This little light of mine. Something like that. Pick it up. Pick it go. You go. That's it. I'm going to let it shine. This little light of mine. I'm going to let it shine. This little light of mine. I'm going to let it shine. 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 That's the sign for any children are here to come down the front. All right, and here you all are. Very good. A couple of extra, oh, lots of kids here this morning. That's good. All right, no crazy hair this week? No, that's all right. They'll have crazy hair again another time. Well, each week here in this church, we read some of the words of Jesus. What did Jesus say? The time has come, he said. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. All right. And to that, in recent days, we've added this words of Jesus, the last words Jesus said before he went back into heaven. And it's a special word for today. So everyone, look at, don't stop fighting down here. Goodness me, we need a bigger front row or something. You can just sit on the floor. How about that? Yes, little kids on the floor. That's a good rule. Okay, here's some more words of Jesus. Let's read them together. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in Judea, and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. All right. And that's a promise Jesus made. And then a few days later, it started to come true. The Holy Spirit was poured out on the disciples, and they received power. And we'll talk about that this morning in our reading. We're going to read a little couple of verses this morning because it's Pentecost. So who would like to be our first reader today? I'm going to start over here, John. Hang on, it's not turned on. Give him a second. Go for it. The day of Pentecost came. They were all together in, the, in one place. Very good. Suddenly, a sound like a blowing of vo violent, violent yes. wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. Very good. They saw, they anyway. saw that what, what seemed to be tongues of fire that spread and came on the rest, on, came and to came rest. to rest on each of them. Very good. Okay. It's not a long reading this morning, so I'm going to skip over to this side. Someone like to read over here? All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Very good. Can I read? Yep. Now they were staying in Jerusalem, God fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. Very good. This is a bit tricky one. You're going to give it a go? When they heard the sound, a crowd came together and. Bewilderment. <laughs> it's a tricky word, isn't it? Everyone say bewilderment. bewilderment. That means they were they're going, huh? All right. Because each one had their own language. Language. Language began spoken. Being spoken. Excellent reading. What grade are you in? Year one. Year one. Excellent reading. Very good. You can go to your teacher and say, I know what the word bewilderment means. Who here speaks a language, a different language? Who speaks different languages? Lots of people here speak their own languages, yes. Different languages to English, the same thing. All right, you going to read for me? No? Okay. Shh. Utterly amazed, they asked, aren't all these who are speaking Ga Gal Galileans? Galileans? Then how is it that each of us hears them in our own native language? Very good. Now, these next bits, I'm not going to get kids to read because that would just be mean, all right? So this is what they say. They say Parthians, Medes, and Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia. Everyone say Mesopotamia. Mesopotamia. Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya near Cyrene, Visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism, and they're listing off all the places they've come from, Cretans and Arabs. 
we hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own tongues. So there were people there from all over the Mediterranean world, all over the Roman world, who'd come to Jerusalem for this special festival, and they could all hear the local languages of their countries being spoken. Sorry? Pentecost was already a celebration because before this happened. That's right. So there was a Jewish festival called Pentecost. It was the Harvest Festival. They'd come together to celebrate all the good things God had given them. Ooh, profound. And now God is giving them something else. Interesting. Anyway, good point. Let's keep reading. Actually, this is the last verse. Let's all read it together. Amazed and perplexed, they asked one another, what does this mean? And the rest of the book of Acts goes on to explain just what is going on here as the gospel spreads to all the nations. All right, the Holy Spirit poured out on them. So I've got this morning just a little demonstration before you go out to Sunday school. So they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. I'm going to use one of these little cups. Here's my water. Okay, do you see my little cup? Okay, I'm going to fill it with water. Don't spill it. Is that cup full? Is that cup full? But it's only so small. How can it be full? It's still full, isn't it? Even though it's small. Here's a bigger cup. All right. Can I fill this cup as well? All right. This cup's full. Right up to the top. Is that cup full? And a little bit over the top. Yes. Which cup is bigger? Well, which one is full? Both of them. There's probably more in that, but they're both full. All right. How about this one? Here's another cup. Can we fill this one too? All right. Fill him all the way up to the top. The thing on the top is called the meniscus. If you can get one of them going, it's wonderful. All right. So which of these cups is full? Which one's biggest? But are they all full? Yeah. Okay. So no matter how big the cup is, it can still be filled. Here's an even bigger cup. Okay, there's a gram, there's a granddad cup. All right. Can we fill this one as well? All right. Is it is it full? All right. Which one's the biggest one? Which one's the smallest one? Are they all full? They're all full. All right. One more one. The jug isn't one of the cups. Goodness me, pedantic children, and they're related to me. They're related to you, Uncle Ken. They get it from you. I'm going to blame you. All right. Here is a cup. What's in this cup? Some rocks. Can we still fill it with water? Yeah. Pour some water in there. Is this cup full? Yeah, even though it's got some rocks in it. Okay. So all the cups are full. So what I want to say to you is, no matter how big or small you are, God can fill you with his love. The Holy Spirit can come and fill you. So you might be a tiny little baby child, like little Vera. Are you a little girl, Vera? Yeah, and Mabel's. But God can fill you with his love. Or maybe you're a child and you're still growing, but God can fill you with his love. Maybe you're a mummy or a daddy or a grandpa or anybody like that. No matter how big or small you are, God can fill you with his love. And even if you're one of these cups here with lots of troubles and lots of problems and lots of challenges, God can still fill you with his love, okay? So no matter what you've got going on in your life, God can fill you with his love. All right. We're going to head out to Sunday school now, I think. No. Yes, that's right. So that, yes, you've gotten it. God is the jug, the water is love, and he's filling us up. Well done. I'm glad you got that analogy. Except God's not a jug, he's a hose pipe, and there's always more love to come. All right? He's a waterfall. He's Niagara Falls. Out you go to Sunday school. Thank you for being part of our family. We love you all. Thank you for that wonderful prayer, Alipacita, that wonderful time of worship. We've been touched this morning, I believe, by the Lord. I want to draw your attention to our notes. If you've come in this morning and didn't get a copy of our notes, please put your hand up and someone will bring them to you.
just a way that you can follow along with what I'm saying. You can check my references at home. You can read up the passages yourself and be encouraged in that way. There are questions on the back which you can discuss with a friend or as a part of a Bible study group as well. Over these last few weeks, we've been talking in the book of Acts and using as our touchstone the words of Jesus as he says, and let's read together, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. The Lord Jesus promises his disciples, his apostles, power. Power when the Holy Spirit is poured out upon them, when he comes upon them, when he baptizes them, when he fills them. And then in Acts chapter 2, the Holy Spirit is poured out on the disciples for the first time and there is a great commotion and preaching and the church begins. And for nearly 2,000 years, the Christian church has spread and grown and divided sent out new branches. Sometimes we call these branches denominations. And this is really just a fancy word that means kinds, different kinds. Let me ask you a question. Would you rather have a $50 note or 10 $5 notes? It's easier to pay with 10 fives, yes. Thank you, Cousin Ken. Would you rather have 10 fives or 25 $2 coins? It won't go that far, too heavy. It doesn't matter what, the, what denomination it is, it's still money. It's still the same thing. They all have the same value, even though they're different denominations. Are denominations a good thing or a bad thing? Or are they just a thing? And what about our denomination? It's good, you like it? I'm glad. Why are we different? What sets us apart from the church just next door? or the church down the road, or the church in the next suburb, or the church in Indonesia, or China, or over, the, or over the world. I'd like you to picture a tree, a big tree. Not a pine tree that's all just straight up and down, but more like an oak tree, or perhaps a jacaranda, or a fig tree like this one. A fig tree with big, long branches that stretch out from the trunk. Church is like a tree, a tree with its roots deeply embedded in the Jewish experience of God's interaction with the Hebrew people, as we read in the Old Testament, and then growing up as a solid trunk for the first thousand years or so, more or less, until West split from East, and the church had its first denominations, Catholic, which is a word that just means universal, and Orthodox the word that just means right worshipping. They did not split over theology. They believed basically the same thing. They split over who was in charge, whether it was Rome or not Rome. The Western church, the Roman church, carries on for another five centuries until there is another major split, and we have some more branches. The Protestants objecting to the corruption, the poor government of the Catholic church. And then the Protestants Protestants split almost immediately into two or more branches. The mainline Protestants, which are the national churches of the countries they're in. So Anglicans in England, the Presbyterians in Scotland, the Dutch Reformed, the Lutherans in Germany, and so on, as each Protestant country has its own official national church. And also another split there, the Anabaptists, the radical reformers from whom we get the brethren the Baptists and different denominations like that. Our denomination traces back to the Anglican tradition. When an Anglican priest in the Church of England and his brother and some friends at Oxford started up a holy club, a way to reform and revitalize their own faith and the faith of the Anglican Church. And because of their methodical or their deliberate approach to faith, they were mocked and called Methodists. The name Methodist was intended as an insult by others. But the Holy Club embraced the name. And so Methodists we are to this day. Be careful what words you use to make fun of people. They may claim them as a badge of honor. 
The two brothers were John and Charles Wesley. John, the more famous, was the preacher and the theologian. Charles was more famous as a hymn writer, wrote over 6,000 hymns. They did not want to start a new denomination. They didn't want to start a new church. They only wanted to strengthen the Anglican church, but it didn't work out that way. So the Methodists and the Anglicans became two separate denominations. You can imagine that branch splitting again. Anglicans going down one way and Methodists going down the other way. And there are many more adventures and twists and turns through the centuries until we arrive at our current denomination, the Wesleyan Methodists. But the essential purpose that drove the Wesley brothers and their friends in the 1740s still drives us now. The Wesley brothers wanted to say that faith should be more than just academic. It should be more than just accepting ideas intellectually. But it should be a personal encounter with the living God that changes our lives, transforms our world, and impacts our hearts deeply, richly, fully. Our branch of the Christian tree is called the Holiness Movement. And we're not the only denomination on that branch. There are many others, the Salvation Army, the Nazarenes, lots of different denominations splitting off from us. And actually, most Pentecostal denominations come off the Methodist branch. So the Assemblies of God, the blokes next door, are our theological cousins. Our denomination, along with our brother and sister churches, are convinced of the reality of holiness of sanctification, of a real experience with God. So on this Pentecost Sunday, when we celebrate the birthday of the church universal, what is our part in that greater story? What is this holiness? What is sanctification? First off, we have to have a word about words. You know that the English language is just three languages all standing on top of each other drenched in a, dressed in a trench coat, Right? Part of our language is from German, part of it's from Dutch, part of it's from French, part of it's from Latin. All these languages mixed in together, a bit of Celtic in there as well. We end up with this strange gobbledygook of languages, which is why we have more words than almost any other language on the planet. We have two words that mean the same thing, the same concept. The word holy is an old English word, and the word sanctity is the Latin version of that word. And in English, we use both of them almost interchangeably. We hardly ever say sanctity, but when we come to sanctification, we're really saying holification, making something holy. Okay? So turn to the person next to you and say, sanctification means holification. Can you do that? It means to make something holy. Okay? And holiness is just the word which we could in another way use sanctiness. So turn to the person next to you and say, sanctiness means holiness. It sounds absurd to us, doesn't it? Those of us who have grown up speaking English, it's ridiculous to say holification. But perhaps if you're a new Australian or a new person, new speaker of English, you think, why don't they just say holification? We, we, we could, but we'd giggle the whole time. So we use the word holiness, And we use the word sanctification. Sanctification is how we get holiness. Sanctification is the verb that gets us to the place of being holy or having holiness, being godly. But what is holiness? What is sanctification? You've probably heard these words for years in church, or perhaps not. We often talk about holiness without using the word. Almost all the preaching in our church is holiness preaching even without using that word. But how do we define it? One of my favorite writers is a man named Samuel Logan Brengel, and he puts it like this. Sanctification is to have our sinful tempers cleansed and the heart filled with love to God and man. That is sanctification. That is holiness. It is in our way to be made like God. It is, as Second Peter says, our way to participate in the divine nature. And much of what follows in this message is based on what Brengel says in his book, 
The Way of Holiness. And if you'd like to read that book, you just need to type it into your search engine, Samuel Logan Brengel, The Way of Holiness. It's in your notes there. And you can get a free PDF of the whole book. And then you'll know what I'm preaching for the next two weeks. Brengel says it like this. He says, a spark from the fire is like the fire. The tiniest twig on the giant oak or the smallest branch of the vine has the nature of the oak or the vine. and is in that respect like the oak or the vine. A drop of water on the end of your finger from the ocean is like the ocean. Not in its size, of course, because the big ships cannot float upon it, nor the big fishes swim in it. But it is like the ocean in its essence, in its character, in its nature. Just so a holy person is like God. Not that they are infinite as God is. They do not know everything. They do not have all power and wisdom as God has, but they are like God in their nature good and pure and loving and just in the same way that God is. Holiness, then, is conformity to the nature of God. It is likeness to God as he is revealed in Jesus. It is Christ-likeness, which is another made-up word which makes sense in English. Christ-likeness, to be like Christ. You might think, and indeed many people do, that this is all impossible. Humans are poor, sinful creatures. We cannot be like Jesus. He was divine and we are not. But let us go to the Bible and see what is written there. Today we'll touch on four ways in which Christians are called to be holy, to be like God, to be like Jesus. Firstly, in speaking of the separation of his disciples from the world, Jesus says, they are not of the world, even as I am not of it. And again, he says, as you sent me into the world, I have sent them into the world. We can be like Jesus in our separation from the world. Jesus was in the world, but he was not of the world. He took no pleasures in its wickedness. He was not spoiled by the world's proud, sinful, selfish spirit. He worked and walked amongst bad people to do them good. But he was always separate from them in spirit. Jesus was in the world, but not of it. And in the same way, holy people are so changed that while they are in the world, they are not of the world. They belong to heaven. They are strangers and pilgrims, doing all the good they can while passing through this world to their father's house their heavenly home. They are separate. They are distinct. They are different from the world. Secondly, in purity. The Apostle John talks about the hope of Christians to see Jesus as he is and says that all who have this hope in him purify themselves just as he is pure. That is a high standard of purity. There was nothing impure in Jesus. He had no unclean habits. He indulged in no impure thoughts or desires. He used no unkind words. He kept himself pure in all things. Christians are called to be pure in heart and in life as he was. Thirdly, Jesus calls his followers to be holy in love. Jesus said, in speaking of God's kindness and love for unjust and evil people, he said, be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. This is in Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, where he lays out how his followers ought to live and act. Jesus tells his followers to love their enemies, to pray for those who persecute them, so that we may be children of your Father in heaven. God causes the sun to rise on the evil and the good and to send rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. God extends love even to his enemies. And this we are called to imitate, as Jesus tells us to be perfect, as our heavenly Father is perfect. Perfect in what? Perfect in love. 
In addition to this command of perfect love, Jesus says, a new command I give you, love one another. How should we love one another? A little bit? A bit more? This much? As much as we can? No, Jesus says, as I have loved you, so you must love one another. And if that doesn't scare you, you're not paying attention. We are to be like Jesus in both our love to God and to others, even to our enemies, particularly to our brothers and sisters, our fellow Christians, and the standard of our love should be the love we see in Jesus. And lastly, talking about himself, Jesus says, believe in me when I say that I am in the Father and the Father is in me. And then a few verses later, Jesus says of his disciples, he says, on that day, he's talking about the day of Pentecost, which we celebrate today, the day when the Holy Spirit is poured out on his disciples. On that day of Pentecost, he says, you will realize that I am in my Father, you are in me, and I am in you. We are then to be like Jesus, having God dwelling in us. Jesus in the Father, the Father is in Jesus. We are called to be like Jesus, in Jesus, with Jesus living in us through the filling of the Holy Spirit. The Christian faith is to be more than just academic assent to theological ideas. It is to be life-changing, with God living in our hearts and minds. And that is what happens when the Holy Spirit The Spirit of Jesus fills our whole life and being. Our part of the church, our holiness branch, testifies and proclaims what the Bible teaches, that we are to be like Jesus. We are to be like him in our separation from the world, in our purity, in our perfect love, and in the fullness of the Spirit. That is what it means. That's what holiness means. Now, this work of holiness, this work of sanctification began in you when you were converted, when you first repented and believed. You gave up your sins. You were in some ways, to some extent, separated from the world. The love of God was in some degree in your heart. You felt that God was with you. But unless you've been completely sanctified, You also feel that there are yet roots of bitterness within, quickness of temper, stirrings of pride, sensitivity to praise or blame, shame of the cross, apathy, materialism. These must be taken away before your heart can be completely clean and before love to God and others made perfect and the Holy Spirit have full sway in your life. When this is done, You'll have the experience which the Bible calls holiness, and that the Wesleyans rightly teach is the birthright of all of God's children. Are there any questions this morning before I conclude? For those who are visiting with us or here for the first time, I'd like to pause and see if there are questions in case I've said something that's unclear or something that people would like to know more about. I don't see any hands. No doubt there are many questions. If you have a question, you can email me. My phone number is there. I'd love to talk to you about these things. I'm going to conclude this morning by saying that holiness is Christ-likeness. The purity of purpose. Having a clean heart in which the Holy Spirit dwells. Filling it with pure, tender and constant love to God and others. So I say to you this morning, imagine a waterfall pouring onto a rock. Over time, the water begins to wear a hole in that rock. First of all, a tiny little hole, and then maybe a bowl, and eventually, over time, it could be a pool. When it's very small, small it's full. And when it grows larger, it's still full. And when it's large enough to swim in, it is still full. That illustrates holiness 
All that God asks is that the heart should be cleansed from sin and full of love. Whether it be the tender heart of the smallest child with only feeble power of loving, or the large heart of the full-grown adult, or the flaming archangel before the throne. This is holiness. I'm going to ask our choir to come and help us now, and in a few moments I'm going to pray. And then the choir are going to sing a simple song asking the Holy Spirit to come and fill us and make us holy. And as they sing, you might want to respond to the call of holiness today. This is a call for all of God's people. We can all grow in holiness. We we all need to be filled with the Spirit. We have here at the front our communion table. It's just a piece of wood, but it represents so much. It's where we place our tithes and offerings, placing them on the altar, giving them to God. It's also where we celebrate communion where we distribute the bread and wine that represent all that God has done for us in Jesus. And so this table is a place for giving things to God and accepting things from God. This morning as the choir sings, there'll be an opportunity to come forward and just simply place your hands on the table. This is a way of saying, I give all that I am to God. You might like to come forward and pray and say, Lord God, I give you all that I am. Please fill me with your Holy Spirit and make me clean. If you'd like to do that while the choir sings, I encourage you to come forward. Have the choir come and form up. I'll pray in just a moment. But as they sing, you might like to come forward and place your hands on the altar and say that prayer. If you need more prayer this morning, just encourage you to stand here at the front. I'll be happy to pray with you or talk to you. But let's pray as the choir comes. Father God, this morning we thank you for Jesus and who he is and what he has done. We thank you that he has promised power when the Holy Spirit comes on us, power to be witnesses in this world, power to be holy people, power to be different. Father God, this morning we ask that you would come by your Holy Spirit, fill this place, fill these people. Father God, that everything we give to you, you make holy. So come, Holy Spirit. Fall afresh on me. Thank you, Father.